Hey everybody, this is Dr. Soren, and I'm super excited to have Jeff Sutton with me today. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, our audience will love hearing about your tales of adventure. This is stuff you read about in books, but you live this every day. So uh, let's just start. You are a uh, missionary, humanitarian, mm -hmm. which you want to call it. You work in South America. South and Central America, yep. I live in uh, Belize. And you uh, basically help the people there. You build yeah. schools. Yeah, we do uh, just a wide variety of things. We have a volunteer training center there in Belize where we have students come for three months. And they receive training. Uh, in a, it's collegiate age students, post-grad. Some of them are in the middle of school who want to take a gap year and serve somewhere. And so we do a, uh, maybe like an orientation you might think of it as. And then we help them get connected to different types of service projects. So three months out of the year, I'm there and I participate in that kind of orientation. And the other, uh, well, I should say six months. It's three months on, three months off. The other three months that I'm not, the next three months would be aviation. I, I, we, I do uh, medivacs and... Uh, so this is kind of our health connection, but as I yeah. thought about it, my show is always focused on health, but you do a lot of medivacs. You're not a medical person, your wife is. Yeah, my wife's a nurse. Uh, I'm a, uh, you know, I'm an A&P mechanic and a pilot, and, and uh, so I do, you know, it's a variety of types of things, uh, everything, and sometimes, you know, of course, with the medivac, we have, you know, some, some interaction on the health side, but... Yeah, my wife's a nurse. I, she, by far, she's yeah. the more of the expertise in the area. Well, as I've listened to your stories and kind of followed you, I've been super inspired by what you do. Uh, as far as the humanitarian missions, you are a volunteer. Yeah. This is not a road to riches, but you just volunteer and serve. Yeah, that's right. You know, there's a, you know, there's a lot more things to life than things. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I, I feel like being a blessing to other people is very rewarding and it's not the what you get back from it like what it's interesting you know in today's society it's all about what you receive mm -hmm. and uh, there's an old adage that says hey it's more blessed to give than receive and and that's really true uh no matter what you know background you have the the joy that comes from bringing joy to someone else's life and making a difference is really something that money can't really buy. Well, and that's what inspired me a lot, because right now, you know, we're in this COVID area, we're having all these protests, and so I just thought it would be great. You're doing something so positive that you're outside of the country and you're just serving and helping people, and to me, that's really inspiring. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's awesome. It's, I, I love what I do. I, um, I was thinking about a, a conversation we had a, a couple days ago uh, about how I got up here and you know because we live in Belize Belize is locked down it doesn't have any COVID didn't so, I think for, it has for those now. that don't know where's Belize Belize is right between uh, south of Mexico between Mexico and Guatemala the Guatemala borders the western side of Belize and Mexico borders the northern side and of course the Caribbean Sea has the second largest reef in the people forget that Australia's got the biggest, the biggest reef yeah, and but uh Belize has got the second, second largest. largest. It's so much. beautiful area. It is. It really is incredible. Belize has an incredible culture. It's it's uh, it's interesting. You have a very uh, diverse culture. You know, you have the uh, Afro Caribbean culture, and then you have uh, which with Garifuna, and uh, and then you have Mayan, and then you have just the Mestiza, which is you know. Latin American, Sp Spanish, Mexican, Guatemalan immigrant, and then you, of course you have Asian, Chinese, Hindus, and Mennonite. There's a lot of Mennonite, uh, very large Mennonite population, which uh, you know just creates for a very diverse. And uh, you know, police is really interesting. They're kind of accepting of all this. You know, the Mennonites they don't drive cars and run the steel wheel tractors, and but yet. You know, they've kind of integrated into society there. They have probably five or six large colonies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, anyway, I just I feel like Belize is that's something that's kind of unique about. It's kind of a mixing pot of culture and different perspectives and views. And, of course, actually, there's a fairly large number of Americans that go there on tourism, for sure, because it's an English-speaking country. It's safe. It's a British colony. Mm -hmm. And then aside from that, 
uh, retirees, people who, you know, those are just transient, but then the retirees that, you know, buy a piece of property down there, dream living on the beach, and, you know, so you have a fair bit of expat, they call them, mm -hmm. uh, population as well. And let's just quickly talk about your link to this area. You married a girl from yeah, Montana, Montana, just across the border here. Yeah, in fact, uh, one of my, uh, right after I got my Instagram rating, I remember I took the small trainer that we had, uh, and I flew it from Michigan mm -hmm. all the way to Montana. I think it took me, I want to say about 16 hours wow. to fly out here uh, in that little trainer. I remember I had to, I was, got stuck in Billings. It was like 105 there, and I was afraid I wouldn't make it over the pass to Bozeman. So I waited till like 5 o'clock that evening, slept in the back of the plane in Bozeman. I was 19, <laughs> 19 years old on wow. an adventure of my life. And then I got to... Just uh, just across the border, just out of Clark Fork there, uh, my uh, wife lives right real near that area. And uh, anyway, yep, I asked her to be my girlfriend then uh, just a few days later. And she had just gotten back from serving in India. Wow. Right there in Calcutta by where Mother Teresa was in, in, an, in another, a different orphanage, but uh, doing the same kind of work. And that was in, oh, I better not tell the dates, but uh, that was an incredible... That was a long, a while back. Anyway, we'll say that. Yeah, wonderful. So that's your kind of link. So that's how I get to see every now and then. Yeah, you come visit. Yep. You got to come see the mother-in-law and you know the family out this direction. Yeah. So wonderful. So you've told me a little bit about uh, the people of Belize. So it's a very diverse culture. So let's just talk about some of the work you do. Maybe even yeah. some of the medevacs. Or sure, sure. So uh, you know, we had just wrapped up uh, a training session and. Uh, our students, they go and work in schools and orphanages and, you know, all types of uh, clinics, all kinds of humanitarian and uh, mission institutes. So uh, it's a combination of all kinds of things and kind of scattered around the globe. One of the, one of, we have about five students or maybe six students in an orphanage in Honduras. Wow. And so... They probably are assisting somewhere around 50 children. And uh, I got a phone call from them the other day. And, and it, it, one of their house parents, their biological child, uh, he was 14, year, he, he, 14 years old and he had a brain tumor. Mm -hmm. And they asked me if I could medibac him up to the States for them. I said, yeah, I'd be willing to do that. He needs a visa. And they said, well, we're working on it tomorrow. We'll have the confirmation from the consulate. And so uh, later on that same day, they called me back and said, you know, it's very urgent. Because I said, well, once you get the visa, probably next week I'll try and, you know, the this was on a Tuesday. And I was, you know, funny thing about flying. Here in the States, it's really easy. You, you know, you just hop, you want to go somewhere, you climb in your plane, you fly a flight plan. And uh, you go. Off you go. Yeah. Not, not the case in, you know, international flights. You know, you got to get permits to get into the country. And, you know, a lot of those permitting take at least 24 hours. And then add COVID on top. With COVID, all these airports are shut down. They don't do any, you know, no airlines are coming in. Nothing's coming and going. In fact, the traditional flight approval pass aren't even open. You're not even contacting the same institution. So I wasn't exactly sure how I was going to be able to get that done. But I was able to get some contacts in Honduras and, uh, and, and work on that. But when I originally talked to him, uh, I, you know, I said, I'm going to at least need a, a week to get flight permits. Well, they called me back that afternoon and said, is there any possibility we can do it faster? We had a really uh, awesome opportunity that somehow the director of the St. Jude Hospital has found out about his case. Now this young man, he can't, uh, he can't swallow now. And the, this tumor is growing very, very rapidly. Mm -hmm. and, this, and this director of Jude Hospital at St. Jude said, you need to get him here as quick as you can. Mm -hmm. as quick as you can. I thought, man, uh, boy, that's a tall order in this, in this time and, you know, of, 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 you know, with COVID. So anyway, Wednesday morning at 10 o'clock, they confirmed they got the visa, and I immediately started uh, the process for an air ambulance medivac into Honduras. Because you said otherwise, there's no planes coming in and out, yeah, but because you ran under a, a medivac Back. air yeah. ambulance, yes. you're able to get a... It's a special authorization. 
Mm -hmm. So that special authorization, basically, I stay on the plane, they bring the patient, I do the refuel, and uh, I'm out of there. So, uh, I, 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 but the interesting thing was, I as a pilot had to do all that paperwork. They would not let me use a handler. And uh, it's a handler. A handler is a, a person who does all the, that kind of paperwork. So kind of for a it. third party. Yeah, thing. that just you know, that you give them the, the details of the flight, and they deal with contacting all those entities. They would they would have nothing of it. Only the pilot. Uh, operator could do the request and fill out the form. So I was uh, hurriedly trying, as soon as at 10 o'clock, I'm like, well, now I've got to go uh, get the plane ready. And I'm trying to, I've, they sent, somebody sent me a, a form and I, it wasn't, you couldn't fill it out. It was a PDF, but you couldn't, it wasn't an editable PDF. So I was like, oh man, so I just printed it and hand filled it out mm -hmm. and then scanned it and sent it to them. Well, I'm driving down the road to the airport to go do the test flight and just make sure everything's good on the plane because uh, because of COVID I had it parked for about a couple months so um, and they text me back and they said oh it's got to be filled out by a computer and you know so here I'm away from my computer now and so I'm downloading apps on my phone trying to figure out how I can make it fill and you know oh, little text awesome. box and stuff so I'm filling it out and I finally get it all filled out and I send it back to them and then I got to get uh, Belize Civil Aviation let me do a, a local flight. And so I finally get everything juggled out, do my local flight, and I land again. And I get a response from them, and they're like, oh, you didn't give us the destination airport. And I'm like, what? In, in Honduras, I'm like, I didn't give you the destination airport. And I look, and sure enough, you know, because you're trying to fill out this PDF on your little phone. And I missed, a, I missed it. I missed the little the box, so I fill that out again and resend it to them. And they finally give me a response approving the, the flight in at 7 o'clock that night. Now, I coordinated everything that I would try and get in there about 9 o'clock the next morning. This is Thursday morning. So it's basically refuel, fill up in Belize, load up. I had a couple of people who were, I was re repatriating to the U.S. And I, from some students and things like that. So I, uh, I was planning on taking three of them and then just pick up the mother and the father and the, uh, the boy with the, the, the tumor. And so I get to the airport and... Uh, the director of immigration is like, oh, you've got to have a, an authorization to leave. It's like an authorization to leave. Now, you've been doing this just for, for people, don't know, for 16 years or yeah, something? Yeah, I've been you've flying been... for about, over doing this overseas things for 16 years. And I've lived in Belize for nine years. So you've, you've I come and done go this... all the time. I do the flight permit process. But it just happens to be that uh, COVID, of course, changes everything. And, you know, the reality is... is COVID changes everything on kind of a semi, you know, wait two days and it'll be different. You know, it seems like that's kind changing of changing by the minute. It really seems to be that's how, how the, the, the ride's rolling right now. So all of a sudden now, I, I, before you would just get an entry permit and mm -hmm. make sure you got the insurance and all the documents in order. But when you leave, they could care less when you leave or how you leave, but not this time. So here I am, I'm filling out a, a departure request. It's not civil aviation that approves it. It's this, um, oversight committee of you know they don't even tell me who's on it but i you know different ministries in the or you know in the government are have to approve my departure so you know you can imagine bureaucratic things nothing is fast you know that's kind of one of the challenges as in the work that i do you face um with international work i mean you just got bureaucracy all over the place so you, you've you learn to try and cope with it and under normal circumstances, you just wait. But here I've got this medivac. I've got this kid that I'm trying to, he's scheduled for surgery in a certain time. And I'm trying to get him up there so that we can, we can meet these, uh, these schedules. And it's just like really intense. So here I am, I'm in the immigration office and I'm, you know, I'm waiting for this permit. And while I'm waiting there, uh, I'm not really, you know, like, it's not like the booths like you would have at an airport. This is like they're, snack room kind of like you would more it was the, like lounge. the break room yeah for the exactly there. exactly so i'm sitting there waiting when visiting with them and one of the immigration officers begins to ask me about the news of what's happening in the u.s belize is really kind of a where i don't know we're fairly connected we don't, we should be a province really in some ways because you know we have little to do with britain even though we're a colony we, you know we have the, the only thing that's you know british is our law system but 
Do you we, drive on the wrong side of the road? No, we drive on we drive <laughs> on the American, American vehicles. American side. Don't, yeah, that, you know that's it. We drive like Americans. We eat American food. We drive American vehicles. You know, everybody goes up to the states. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's pretty much a little America down there. But anyway, so they're telling me about all this news that's going on up there, and I got to be honest. I told her, you know, I'm. I got to be honest with you. I quit watching the news a long time ago. I said, that's just it's all over the place. I, I was like, it's just kind of distracting and frustrating. And I, I just said, I can't make any, I just quit watching. It was just like, oh man, you just, it's just terrible, you know, what they're doing to people. And, and, you know, it's, and she begins to start telling me how, um, you know, all the atrocities and how, you know, and kind of insinuating that I don't understand what it's like to be marginalized because, you know, uh, I'm white. Mm -hmm. And what what race and nationality? Uh, she was she's Afro Caribbean Afro Caribbean, you know. So, uh, and you know, I gotta be. I've been living overseas for sixteen years. I I I tell her, I I kind of I'm race blind. I mean, to me, you know, people ask me something. When I first started, they asked me if I was American, you know, because you just I got a, you know, the the Latin term is gringo, and you know, so I've got that kind of a face and. But after a while, you know, you lose the accent, and uh, and pretty soon they ask me if I'm from Brazil or that I'm from somewhere else, and you know. But when you see people, I just see people now. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, I don't even necessarily. I mean, I I love America, but I'm you know once you live away from the culture, American culture, it seems somewhat foreign to me now too. It's just because I'm used to. You know, uh, I'm a mix of all kinds of things. So, anyway, that, you know, people just from first sight, they, they kind of, they make assumptions. You know, I said, well, one of the things I can, you know, I've understood as a, as a foreigner, you always are somewhat, and I don't want to know, use the word uh, disadvantaged. You just don't have the same status as a national. Right. And it's logical. I'm a foreigner. I'm requesting to live in your country. It's like, as a foreigner, you're not going to, you know, get all belligerent on an immigration official in another foreign country. They <laughs> yeah. make the rules, man. So you, if you want to be there, follow the rules. If you don't, beat it. There's, you know, you're the one wanting to come here. And, and so you're, you're, you don't you're have... You're kind of at their mercy. You're at their mercy, and you don't have the same rights as a national. It's just, it's how it is, you know. And so... You know, you you understand. I mean, I, in, in that sense, uh, you know, I can I can understand, and I have been uh, treated unjustly on in numerous occasions. You know, right. that, at least you feel that way. Right. And uh, but you know, and so I tried to explain that a little bit, and she's like, "Oh, but you just can't ever understand." And I said, "Well, that's true." You know. Uh, but I said, uh, as, she, as she was kind of pressing that thing, I thought, you know, uh, and you know, it's interesting, there's, there's a, there was probably about, I don't know, maybe eight or nine uh, immigration officials in that room. So all these immigration officials there. Yeah, she puts you're you on listening, the they're, you're, yeah, they're kind of listening to our conversation, and she was all, she was all kind of riled up about it a little bit, you know, okay. and, and, uh, and I, I'm not a, I, my personality is just not that way, I don't really get riled up about things like that, but uh, so... And I said, you know, wait a minute, wait a minute. I said, you know what? But I will tell you what I do understand for sure. I said, I do understand about privilege. Okay. And that got her attention. I said, yeah, <laughs> it, yeah. it got quiet all the yeah, time. Yeah, everything kind of got quiet. I said, oh, yeah, I definitely understand about privilege. I said, I'm privileged. And my children are privileged. In fact, my children live a very interesting lifestyle. I think, you know, my children, uh, all of them have been born overseas. Well, my, my first daughter actually was born in Montana. Uh, and then we uh, probably about maybe within a month and a half after we got all the paperwork, passports and stuff, we went back overseas. So, uh, my other two children were born overseas. So, uh, they come back and they see the American lifestyle and as Americans, it's quite normal, but the rest of the world does not live that. So, you know, mm -hmm. to have the the toys and the plastic playhouses and the slides and the swing sets and the boats and the jet skis and the, you know all the things that we kind of consider as normal mm -hmm. uh, th that's not very normal for the rest of the world and we kind of we've chosen to live a very simple lifestyle it's there's no you know 
there, there's nothing wrong with the other things, but the simple lifestyle that we we've chose to live is a great one. Mm -hmm. My kids have different. They get to they they see the world. My kids are super privileged, and I tell them that you know you guys are wealthy. When they go up there, they don't up here. They don't necessarily feel very wealthy, but then when they move down there, and we we live in a you know, a thousand square foot little ranch house. It's kind of normal. With three kids. With three kids. Yeah, but it's, you know, it's, I'm in, the, I'm at, there's no winter. My kids are never inside. They're out, they gotta, you know, we live in the country. My kids are running around. They have a great time. Anyway, you know, I've got a shop 50 feet from the house and they're, they're my kids, my son's always building stuff down there and they got the tree forts and the rope swings and they got swings. They got all kinds of stuff. So they're, but in the, the village that we go to church in and where we do humanitarian work and things like that is full of illegal immigrants. And that's what I told the immigration lady. I was like, you know, my kids now have to relate with all these illegal immigrants, people who are impoverished, running from a terrible life somewhere else and trying to make something better, but they, they live well below the poverty line. And they look at my kids when they come over. I mean, I invite these kids over to my house. We have meals at my house. And when they come in, I live in a mansion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So by American standards, it'd probably be a pretty... Yeah, pretty simple house. We would, we would consider this probably lower middle. Mm -hmm. You know, it's clean. It's nice. It's just not fancy. Right. So, uh, you know, where... You know, a thousand square foot house is not, it's a, someone who lives kind of in, almost in an apartment. Mm -hmm. You know, that's kind of the, the size of it. So, but, you know, but to their standards, these kids that I'm inviting over, wow, this is everything. It's amazing. What They would want to have what I have. Now, I tell my children, I'm like, you know, because with privilege, and I told this to the immigration lady, I said, you know what, we're privileged. I, but with privilege comes responsibility. Mm -hmm. The more privilege you have, the more responsible the most responsibility you have to share those blessings or quotes privileges with others. Mm -hmm. You know, and I said it's so easy to kind of rail up on Facebook and rant and rave and you know condemn what everybody else is is or isn't doing. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to your own situation, uh, what are you doing? You know, and I feel like that we kind of come to a society as that it's easy to just kind of spout off and say, well, it's this person's fault or it's that person's fault or this institution or that entity. But in the end of the day, we each have personal privilege and responsibility. And the that if the world would take charge or uh, or to live up to their responsibility, of course we would be in a different place. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're telling this lady how privileged yeah, your kids yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. Again, your kids are white. Uh, yeah, so yeah. They're sure, sure, they're privileged, and yeah, exactly. So I was telling her that, and then and basically I said, you know, I said we all have a level of privilege. Mm -hmm. I said, you know you're privileged. And I said, well, in fact, before I told her that, I said, you know, really, the reality is, is I'm privileged too. And I said, in fact, I'm here sitting in your office today because I'm privileged. Okay. I said, I'm, I have a pilot's license. I grew up in a poor family. Uh, my parents couldn't pay for my pilot's license. I actually ended up getting my pilot's license working on a local airfield at a mechanic shop, waxing airplanes and helping out an American Airlines pilot took me under his wing. He had about seven planes and he let me wash and wax those things. He paid me really good and he had a trainer and we'd trade hours for mm -hmm. the trainer and uh, that was the probably the main way I got my pilot's license. I got it uh, right when I was 17 and then later on, a few years later is when I flew out here to uh, uh, you know, meet my wife. But that, you know, not everybody has that opportunity. And it's not about intelligence. Mm -hmm. I tell people, man, a monkey can fly. You just, you just, you know, train, spend enough time training it. Look, we got all these cars that can drive themselves now. Mm -hmm. You know, I said, it's not that. It's just about opportunity. Not everybody has the opportunity. Learning to fly, and I was telling this to the immigration officer, learning to fly is expensive. It costs mm -hmm. a lot of money. 
not everybody has that kind of money. And I happened to not have that kind of money, but I still was ended up being privileged enough to obtain that license. I said, so now I'm a pilot, so I have that privilege because very few people in the world have it. And I said, I have access to an airplane, a nice one. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an 11 seater pressurized airplane that flies at 275 knots, you know, 300 and some mile an hour. I said, it's not, not everybody has access to that. So I said, now with that privilege comes responsibility. I said, I'm leaving the house at four o'clock this morning, leaving. And my wife is crying and asking me, do you really have to go? And I said, well, if it was our 14 year old daughter, I have a daughter that's 14. I said, we wouldn't be having this conversation. I, I would be in this plane and I would be flying her to the U S you'd be in there and we would be gone, mm -hmm. you know, to get her the best possible treatment ever. And I said, and the, of course the immigration officers know that Belize is closed. When I leave, I won't be able to come back. They don't want anybody, not even so, nationals in Belize. If you're a Belizean citizen, they won't let you back in the country. Belize doesn't have coronavirus. So just so the audience understands, your wife is crying because she knows that you may not be able to come back in the country for who knows how long. Who knows how long or when we're going to see each other again. You know, my plan is to try and refile a permit and get in there and pick her back up at some point. And we're... I don't really exactly have a real clear path. And of course, with COVID, everything changes. Give it a couple days and something's going to change. You know, there's right. going to be some new rule, some other thing. Who knows what's going to happen? So the, the future is fairly uncertain. Okay, you know? so you're explaining to the immigration officer, hey, I'm taking a chance by taking this random kid I don't even know to yeah. try to save their life and yeah. get them to the hospital. Yeah, exactly. And I was like, you know, and why am I doing this? Well, because I'm privileged. And I with privilege comes responsibility. I said, so, you know, I, you're right. I don't necessarily understand what it means to, you know, be marginalized and all these kind of things. You know, I, it's hard to, we're, we're, we don't live in someone else's shoes, mm -hmm. but the reality is, is that we are privileged. And with that privilege comes responsibility. I said, each, you have that privilege. And I mean, how many Belizeans would love to have your job in the janitor that was in the room break room? It's like, I'd like to have that job. You can see her nodding her head, you know. All of a sudden, she yeah. feels privileged. <laughs> yeah. I was like, yeah. And she's like, it's true. I mean, you know, I said, hey, it's a solid paycheck. I mean, I said, how many Belizeans, I mean, how many illegal immigrants would are just, just don't have the privilege of having a social security card and being able to get work mm -hmm. because they're illegal, they can't work. I said, it's a, you know, they would just love to have that. So I said, you know, each one of us have privilege. Mm -hmm. And with that privilege comes responsibility. I said, you aren't responsible a day to do a medibag. You're not a pilot, don't have the plane. So it's not your responsibility. But there are people in your sphere of influence in which you can share that privilege and that blessing. I said, so, you know, it's easy to get distracted and kind of blame everybody else about how terrible, you know, the world is or how terrible, your, you know, the, the marginalization is and how, but at the end of the day, when it comes down to you and you pass the need on your street or you see someone broken down on the side of the road and you've got four inflated tires and they've got a flat tire and you just, well, I'm kind of, I don't want to stop or I don't want to help or, or, I mean, it's just the small details of life. You know, well, we, we, uh, I'm young and youthful and my neighbor that's next door to me is kind of old and has a hard time mowing his lawn, but you know, why would I go over there and help him? I'm too busy. Well, you know, but I can sure rant and rave about what everybody else isn't doing. But when we ne neglect to use our own privilege, you know, and same thing with refugees that come in and that we, t you know, people talk about, well, Emory, and I don't, I don't really. I'm not trying to be political or even give opinions here, but what I'm just saying is, is that there are people that could use assistance, could use help, could, you could, you could, uh, share your privilege with, but it's just much easier just to blame everybody else. Yeah. You know? Well, and that's what fascinates about me about you is you've chosen and you've dedicated your life. I mean, yeah. you could have the full on American life with sure. two cars, a dog yeah. and, yeah. you know, and all that, but you choose to just really do this. Well, yeah, and that's what people don't realize, how fulfilling it is, you know, to make a difference in someone's life. And I, I told the immigration lady, I said, you know, I can't change what other people do. 
but mm-hmm. I certainly can do what I can do. And I said, uh, this young boy, I said, he's a Nicaraguan kid. He's a, he's from Central America. So he's a foreign kid to He's them. a foreign so he's kid to Honduras. He's, yeah. he, even Nicaragua is the poorest Central American country. Ecuador and Nicaragua are both the poorest one. And, you know, he, he he's a, you know, it's a nobody. Even Belize mm-hmm. is kind of the high end of Central America. It's a oh. British colony. They don't even need a visa to go to the, you know, England. Mm-hmm. They can travel to Europe, and most of them get visas to the States like nothing. It, mm-hmm. You know, it's only got 350,000 people. It's got a full-on U.S. embassy there. You know, it, it, it's it's hardly third world. I don't consider it third world, you know. And so... Anyway, in this kid, he's, you know, how many kids die in Honduras with no one to help him? I said, so this young man has now all of a sudden, I said, become extremely privileged. Mm-hmm. He's going to fly in a in a commercial, you know, in a charter flight that he could never afford. Not even mm-hmm. dream. Not even 10 years of salaries would pay for it. By both of his parents working 10 years, could they pay for that one flight? Never. And he's going to be treated by the director of St. Jude Hospital. I mean, okay, that, you talk about skilled, you know, this is, uh, now he's privileged. Mm -hmm. I said, and you know, if he survives it, he'll have that responsibility to share that privilege with someone else. Incredible, you know. And so, so, yeah. So, did you take the kid? We yeah, finally, finally, uh, at, at, at around noon, I finally got my uh, the permit to leave, and I flew into Honduras. We picked him up, and I landed in Key West, and then flew him into Asheville, uh, North Carolina. And the next morning, early, I got into Asheville, North Carolina, at one o'clock in the morning, and that has a whole other you know story behind it. But uh, it was, it had its challenges. And uh, what was what was uh, neat though is that there was several people, key people along the way that helped make that a possibility. The uh, anyway, we landed there about twelve thirty at night, and they took him into uh, the operating uh, the ER. I think at sometime early the next morning, and so you know we do the best we can. I can't, you know, I would, I'd love to say I could solve all the kids in the world's problems and, and, and you can't do, you can't solve everyone's problems, but the things that come to your door and I would, I would encourage people to even step a little bit farther and not just wait for a problem to come to their door, but seek out and look for ways to, because in America we're, we're blessed. Yeah, people yeah. forget this, how, you know, that's why I think travel, and we've tried to take our kids outside the country some, because yeah. you forget how blessed we are in America when you go see poverty in some of these exactly. countries. Exactly. You know, and I, was, and I said that to the immigration officer, I said, these people who are rioting on the streets, I said, I have friends in Chad, Africa, mm-hmm. who would love to be the people on the streets who are, you know, talking about how marginalized they are. They would love to have the marginalized life compared to the life that they have of starvation because of famine, because of malaria. You know, in, in Chad, I don't think there's a family that's there that doesn't know what it means to lose a family member to malaria. Right. And, of course, my in, in fact, my, my friend, a good colleague of mine, you know, an American, you know, white uh, family, he... he buried his son in Chad, and it's the same age as my daughter, to malaria. And right. I think we both have, so I've met, I think you're referring to Gary? Gary, yeah. Yeah, and uh, and his father actually came to Sandpoint, picked up a Quest aircraft. That's correct. Yes. So so he's got a little link to this area, yeah, absolutely. too. absolutely. But he lost a child to malaria, and our another mutual friend we have is James yeah. Appel. Appel, yeah. Who, who's been a, a missionary doctor, if you will, exactly. down there. Exactly. And I've had him on this show. Uh you know, he's lost uh, actually two kids to malaria. Mm-hmm. I know it. It's Chad is a challenging place, and you know, and living in Chad. Yeah, in, in Chad, it's a, it's a just a, a you know, and how many people you know, but we don't hear about it on the news. And of course, James Lapel isn't on the news, and we don't hear it talk. You know, James, what a fantastic example of a person who said, you know, I'm privileged enough, and I'd like to take my privilege of being a physician and someone who's had an opportunity to get an education. 
and give to someone, these people who don't have that privilege, and, uh, and benefit their lives. And of course, in the spiritual side of things, you know, we're, we're trying, we want to impact people uh, because we, we value, you know, I, I as a Christian value lives. Mm -hmm. People matter, people, people's lives matter. They're, they're valuable, they're just not some object. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that's inherent in Christianity and, 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 and those types of, the teachings of Christianity is that, hey, Listen, you are a valuable person because you're created by God. Now, other people are motivated by, you know, different reasons, but those are that's one of the motivations that drive me, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, anyway, at the end of that conversation with the immigration officer, you know, I was we were all talking. And I said, you know, it's stressful. I'm stressed. It's a lot of responsibility. I'm trying to get this kid out. I got this permit issue. And you know, here I've made it. I didn't realize I needed to have an exit permit. I, I was supposed to be there three out, two hours ago. You know, here I'm getting behind schedule, and and this is a, this is a problem. And uh, you know, one of the immigration officers, mm -hmm. uh, you know, another Afro uh, Caribbean, um, he he put his hand on my shoulder and he says, "You know, brother, can I pray with you?" Right mm -hmm. there in the middle of that office, you know. <laughs> and obviously, you know, they know my my religious affinity. And I said absolutely, and uh, and so he we he offered a prayer right there. You know, I felt so blessed that you know I felt like they understood. They knew that to me it has nothing to do about race or anything. If any of their children had a problem, I would sit in the same room and do the same thing for anybody that I could. If I had, if, if it was within my means to do that, well, I had that responsibility. To, to share the blessings that I that I have, you know, the mm -hmm. privilege that I have. Mm -hmm. So it was neat. The room got uh, was very quiet after that, and I could see that that uh, young lady really reflecting. Uh, you know, so I hope it made an impact in their lives at well, some point. Well, I am so inspired that you know you instead of uh, you know you could be working for American Airlines or or some big you know airline company and having a very you know, plus job in America, but you choose to be down in South America serving, and uh, that story is super inspiring to me. Yeah, absolutely, and you know, it, there's a lot more to, to, to life than money. Uh, you know, it, there's a lot more, you know, people kind of think, oh, this will make you happy, but money buys stuff, but you know, relationships, investing in people have the highest return. I mean, you can't believe what it's like when you, when I go, I go places, I go back to that school, and there's young people that I knew when they were five, and now she's 21. And uh, they run up to you and they throw their arms around you and they give you a big hug and they're so excited to see you. I mean, I'm thinking about a girl that got lost for two months and I, I was able to do a whole other story. But anyway, she, we found her. And I was the one who found her. By airplane or by uh, hiking? By, by, by hiking into a community and we took the police and she was, she was actually kidnapped. And Anyway, long story, but I'm just saying... Investing in that one person. Well, that one person actually came to Belize and studied at my the move training, and now she's serving. She's getting her nursing license. It's just it, that investment in people. It's so. See, how many rewarding. people have a story like that that you they know? can say they actually went the extra mile to find this person? <laughs> yeah. And I know there's probably tons of people, oh, yeah. hundreds of people that you've sure. thrown out in medevacs, sure. where people would literally die yeah. if you didn't pull them out. Sure. Yeah. I mean, anyway, it, 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 but it just that's what I'm saying. It's just so fulfilling. To make that kind of difference, and uh, and it's possible. I'm just a, I'm nothing special. I'm just a normal person from Northern Michigan who, you know, uh, through different circumstances, which I believe are divinely orientated, uh, have the great privilege of being able to serve in this capacity. With yeah. that privilege comes responsibility. Love it. So, uh, if people want to get in contact with you, what's your website? Yeah, so the website's mosesinternational.org. Um, you can contact the email there or movetraining.org. And that's the uh, Volunteer Training Center in Belize. You can get in touch with us through there. You know, we are always, you know, open to having people come and get involved. It doesn't necessarily matter your religious affinity or non religious. Um, we work with all kinds of people. If you're interested in being involved with some sort of a humanitarian endeavor, contact us. Yeah.
That's awesome. And people can also donate there, I know. Yeah, yeah, through that website, you can, you can, uh, there's some links to donate or get in contact with us and we can facilitate you the information yeah. as well. Because one thing that I think is incredible, you you really don't ask for money. You are no, so humble. No, I don't, yeah, it's, that's, a, that's just something we don't do. We don't but, do a lot of fun. But the money just seems to It to works flow. out, you know. Because you're building schools and you're flying around this aircraft and, and you're able yeah. to do it. It's yeah. not, it seems like, you, from what I've heard from you, there's not a lot left over, but somehow you have enough to, yeah. to make those trips. It's true. Yeah, that's basically how that ends up working. And it's, uh, you know, of course, uh, my convictions are that's a... It's a divine, uh, you know, uh, it, it's really a kind of a, a partnership that I have with uh, the Lord and, and me that we've kind of got a deal going on. And so far, that seems to work pretty well. Yeah, love it. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for coming on. Again, if people want to uh, look you up, Moses International and Mos MosesInternational.org. And MoveTraining.org. Move, training .org. Move tra is the name of the volunteer training center. So. Yeah, awesome. Jeff, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks for the invitation.